Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have become real to us, because we believe the more real they are, the more power we can draw from them, the more we can apply them to our lives, and we need that. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and today we're doing a short cast. Uh, this is based on really the the comments and requests from a number of my uh, audience members when I talked with Trevin Hatch about elements of daily life in uh, Jesus's day. And uh, there was a lot of positive response from that and also some requests for a little bit more. So we're going to talk about um, the kinds of houses they had, the kinds of what the villages looked like, the kinds of places they lived, what it took to, to create food, the kind of food they ate. I think we talked about what they dressed like in, in the last one and health issues. So we'll cover those kinds of things today. So you can just picture Jesus and his apostles a little bit better as you're reading these things. Before that, I want to take care of a couple of business items. I don't do this on my podcast very much. I know most podcasts do, and I don't do it very much, but uh, every now and then we need to do it. So I just want to take care of a couple of items. The first is to give a really, really heartfelt thanks to those who helped me with this podcast. My guests, I have so many wonderful guests who just do this out of love of helping everyone learn about the scriptures. And then, of course, my my friend, he's a a childhood friend and roommate in college uh, that I, I'm so close with, Rich Nichols, who who does the music, uh, and my uh, editor. Who, uh, I've had a number of people do editing, but right now it's my daughter, Alexia Mielstein, who's getting ready for her mission. Um, and none of this would be possible if it wasn't for Lisa Spice. I'm so grateful for Lisa Spice, who I really wouldn't have even started the podcast without her. She kept encouraging me. I thought for years about doing something like this, but just didn't know how and didn't know how to how to do it uh, or, and and just couldn't kind of couldn't quite get myself to do it and um she really really encouraged me and a number of people have but she really encouraged me and as we talked about it she said how much she would love for that to happen and um a few days later uh, <laughs> uh mike's showed up a uh, re- really nice mike showed up on my uh, doorstep that she had purchased for me and uh, services that she'd purchased for me and she um puts in the money for me to to get things like pay for editing and uh, some of the services we do um, and um, uh, lighting that we need uh, for the video portion and and a bunch of other things. This just could not happen without Lisa. There's no way it could happen. Bless her and and we're grateful for her. Uh, I wouldn't have started it and I wouldn't be able to keep going without Lisa and her vision and her support. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for her. So thank you. Uh, we put it in the show notes every week, every single week I, for every episode we do that. But I wanted to express my gratitude um, to all of them and, and especially to Lisa. Uh, I also just wanted to let you know, uh, and I guess this is a shameless plug, but I'd, I'd like to get the word out there that uh, I have a book that uh, has just come out. It's really a booklet. I think you can get it on seagullbook.com for, I think, $4. Maybe it's $3. I think it's $4. Uh, so it's not expensive. It's uh, on uh, how to find blessings in the covenant path, how to find those blessings that are promised to uh, people who keep the covenant that President Nelson asked us to look for. And so it has lists along with some some uh, explanations and exercises to go through to help you get good at finding those in the scriptures. And then an explanation of what it means to be on the covenant path and how it's not a, a checklist and, and what it has to do with love and what it has to do with our lives and that kind of a thing. And trying to answer questions that I've found people have had even after my other book, um, God Will Prevail, um, that uh, I, I'm finding people still have questions. So this is trying to answer some of those questions, and uh, it, it's just written to be helpful. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, given that it it's only like $4, I think I probably make about $0.04 cents a copy. So it's not uh, for money. It's just to help people. So uh, please uh, see if it helps you and help, see if it helps people that you know. Uh, I also wanted to pump my, uh, my son, and I, I think I mentioned this once before, but he uh, is just for the the sake of trying to help youth, has started his own podcast. Sometimes he, it's a little hard for him to do. He likes to have friends come and sometimes it's hard to get them to come over and, and so on. But bless his heart, he just wants to help people. So he has a podcast that's usually like three to five minutes each episode, one a week. Uh, that are aimed at youth and and what the reading might have to do in the, the real life. So it's called Youth Follow Him, and it's only on YouTube, uh, but you can get on YouTube and look for Youth Follow Him, and you'd be able to find um, so that that podcast that if you know any youth or children, children or youth, I think, like eight and up, 
Uh, I, it's done with them. So they, sometimes they have animals on, so they try and do some fun things often. And, and, uh, Jacob talks about things he experienced in Israel to kind of make it become more real, uh, sometimes, but it's just short and, and hopefully helps youth be a little more into the come follow me program. So uh, I wanted to take care of that little bit of business as well. So now let's talk about, um, rural life and, and life for Jesus. He does, uh, there's a significant portion of the gospels talk about his time in Jerusalem because that's where some really high impact things happen where he he goes to rituals typically he's only going to Jerusalem for like the feast of tabernacles or the feast of dedication which is Hanukkah uh, or Sukkot the feast of booths those kinds of things uh Passover I can't remember if I mentioned that um and so some big things happen there he has some showdowns with Pharisees and Sadducees and and teaches some pretty significant doctrine, like he's the uh, light of the uh, and life of the world, and so on. Um, but he doesn't spend that much time in Jerusalem. Most of his ministry is spent in the Galilee area, and so we're going to try and give a picture of what life is like in the Galilee area. Mostly, uh, we he's in villages. There are a couple of towns. So Tiberius is is uh, going it, it kind of in the midst of of being built. Um, You've got uh, Magdala is a decent size town, but most things are are more along the lines of villages. Capernaum may be kind of straddling the whether it's a village or a town at his time. It will become a town later, certainly. Um, but let's just uh, give an idea. So they, they have uh, mostly very, very narrow streets that are for the most part dirt. Uh, you may have a couple main streets that have some cobblestone, but but typically they're just hard packed dirt streets and really narrow so that it's hard to move along in them. So that, for instance, uh, when the Savior's going from the one place to another in Capernaum and, and a woman touches his hem, and they, he says, who touched me? And they say, what do you mean, who touched you? Everyone's touching everybody. That's because they're in narrow streets. Um, and as I said, uh, dirt, there's no running water. Um, they would use outhouse kind of things. Um, there in these areas there's really not a lot of hellenization or you know romanization or whatever you'd like to call it there's no uh uh very little of that kind of influence and they're very religiously conservative i want you to be able to picture the kind of houses they're in now the savior himself throughout his ministry he's clear he doesn't have a home that he stays in my guess is that when he's in capernaum he uh stays at peter's house and wherever he goes he might stay in mary's house in magdala uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, we don't know, but he stays with other people, but still he's staying in people's homes. So it's worth thinking about what these are typically. I mean, there, there are exceptions and in really small villages like Nazareth, it might've been a bit different than this, but in most of these villages, what you get are, are, um, uh, kind of groups of houses and these would be family dwellings. So you might have three or four houses all adjoined to each other, maybe consisting of like a couple of buildings that, that go around an open courtyard. And that open courtyard is uh, is where all the, the extended family meets and does things together. So then you have like these these uh, uh, buildings that might be like the grandma, and grandpa and several of their kids with their families and so on. So nuclear families may have had their own rooms, not necessarily, but they may have had their own rooms. But they're in these buildings where their grandma, grandparents, cousins, uh, aunts and uncles, these kinds of things. All right. The homes are typically made of field stones. So just stones you can get. They didn't build out of, of uh, wood much, they're mostly stones. So you just gather stones. There are plenty of stones all over. And in the Galilee area, these are mostly really hard basalt stones so from volcan volcanoes right uh and uh just hard and sharp uh stones and they stick them together with mud uh the walls usually can't take a really heavy roof and you it's hard to make a big heavy roof out of these stones uh, there were uh, beams that were made out of stones but then you put on top of them um wood uh and and a lot of them wouldn't have even had stone beams they would have wood beams and then you put reed and mud plaster and that kind of thing uh to make the the roof which is going to take some repair work and maintenance quite often um the floors in the courtyard would typically be cobblestone so just uh field stones that they they gather and and piece together uh and then in the the homes on the bottom floor typically this is just going to be hard packed dirt again so in the courtyard, uh, they would share a lot of the household duties, and this would most often be the women. So they, they could have shared ovens there, um, shared grinding stones, 
Uh, and in the Galilee area, these will typically be made from basalt uh, again, which is good because they're hard and they grind well. Uh, we have found uh, some limestone grinding stones. That's not as good because it's softer and you're going to get a little limestone in your food. But uh, in any case, they've, they've got grinding stones. Uh, they have uh, sometimes oil presses or wine presses. That's less common, but that's possible for them to have oil and wine presses. Um, and often the women would make meals together and they would have shared meals within the large group. So in, in these villages, they, they would typically have maybe um, maybe some tables um, uh, and not necessarily always uh, that they would eat around. Usually they're going to sit on the ground. They may need mats if it's muddy that day or something like that. Um, in other places, they might have things to sit on, and they might even sometimes have tables in this triclinium, this kind of three tables put together and, and half three sides of a rectangle kind of thing. But that that's uncommon in most of the places where the Savior goes. Uh, we know that when there's a big meal, of course, uh, and you have guests, then uh, you, you decide who sits where according to prestige and so on. And Savior even talks about that in some of his teachings. Uh, and that may be around tables and and maybe not, but but bigger meals would often be. And maybe you're sitting on mats or maybe little stools or chairs, but most of the time you're just sitting on the ground. Um, and uh, th it's, it's pretty clear that everyone in the family shared a few dishes. There may have been some exceptions, uh, exceptions to that, um, but typically th they were shared dishes and shared meals and that kind of a thing. Uh, ritual bathing is is really common. So we find a lot of mikvah oats. So a mikvah is singular. That's a, like a, a, a place where you can ritually immerse yourself. Um, and the plural is mikvah oat. We find a lot of those from the first century BC to around 70 AD. Um, and so you do that for a, a number of things that would make you ritually impure under the law of Moses. Uh, and the water had to be water. It couldn't be just standing water. It had to be what's called living water or moving water. So it has to have a way to come in and out. So even better is to do your ritual immersion, say, in the Sea of Galilee. So if you're right on the seaside, it's less common to have these mikvahot, although there are some, for instance, in Magdala. But um, uh, typically, you, 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 it's easiest to have living water where, you, you know, the Sea of Galilee has an in and an outlet. So it's 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 pure. Uh, if not, you have to find some way for that water to be coming in and out. Um and there's some symbolism when the Savior talks about living water. Some of that symbolism for his audience would be this is the kind of water that uh, stays pure and clean. And so you can do ritual immersion with it. We'll talk about that some more. Um, hand washing had become pretty big. Um, you would ritually wash your hands before a meal. Uh, and sometimes the Savior is criticized for not doing that. Um, some uh, Jews, like those in Qumran, the, the community, the Essene community, we think Essene, um, that created the Dead Sea Scrolls, they started to create uh, ritual and moral purity, but those aren't the same things. Uh, and and it seems like a, Jesus certainly understood that, and a number of other people did. Um, everyone becomes ritually unclean. If you come into contact with death, blood, sickness, those kinds of things make you unclean at, at birth, uh, uh giving birth, uh, conceiving, the, all these things can make you ritually unclean. So everyone's going to be ritually unclean from time to time. And then there are things put into place to help you become clean. And I think there's some great symbolic teaching in there as well. Um, but but there were some groups that started to equate ritual and moral purity. And I think that was a mistake. Most plates were made from clay. Uh, from that area, we get this kind of light yellow color of clay that can be blotchy, but then they'd put a glaze. We call it a slip. But it's a kind of an orangish reddish slip. That's the most common thing that would be on these plates. To, to they could be fired. I, I mean, on occasion, some stuff was just sun dried. But typically, they, they you try and fire them so they're harder and last longer. And you have this glaze that works on them. So most of the the um, plates and and bowls and uh, jugs that they would store things in and so on, and even like some kind of rounded cups would uh, be from this light yellow clay with an orangish reddish um, slip or glaze put on it. Light typically came from an oil lamp. We we tend to think of candles. They didn't use candles. They had these simple oil lamps. Most of the ones that you'll see depicted from the Savior's time are actually from the Byzantine period. If they have all sorts of intricate decorations on it, it's probably the wrong time period. They were pretty simple oil lamps when you'd get a flax wicks and a wick and use olive oil in there and and burn it. And uh, that's what would give you your light. And so you, you typically you'd have just one lamp. Uh, and then you'd put a couple of those around the house. Some people who are more wealthy would buy some that would like have a center thing with several places for wicks to come uh, spreading out from there. Um, they did have glass. Roman glass is is pretty good. Um, it was still a little bit new in the Savior's day. It, it broke somewhat easily. So most people wouldn't use glass for eating and that kind of a thing. 
Um, and if, if any vessels that were going to be used for washing, for this ritual washing, they had to be made from stone under the law of Moses. So carved out of stone, uh, that's what it had to be if it was going to be used for washing. Now, if you're going to prepare your meal, um, we talk about daily bread. Uh, you have to start with uh, most of their grains. The, grain, the most common was actually barley an emmer and wheat. Wheat was not as common because it's not as hardy um, and so on, uh, meaning it's harder to grow. You have to have just the right conditions. But they did use all of them, barley, emmer, and, and uh, wheat uh, and other grains. But those are the most common ones and, and barley and emmer being the most common. Uh, so you're going to have to grind that each day. And a lot of people estimate that it's going to take you about three to four hours of grinding a day. So that might be nice when you have a group of you working together. So you don't have to, it's good. I would, I don't know anyone who can use these basalt uh, grinders for three to four hours straight. Uh, you can take turns and spell each other off and so on while the other one's doing some other kind of tasks. So uh, when we talk about daily bread, you're going to see it's quite a task. Um, you, you grind it and then, uh, you've got to get it to rise. I mean, there are some flat breads and they would use flat breads, especially around the Passover, but more common to use some that would rise slightly, not quite like ours, not puffy. And they didn't use yeast the way we do. Um, what they would use is older dough, like maybe even up to three weeks old that had developed yeast naturally. And then you mix that in with your new dough. And you have to let it rise, and it takes a while. So there are reports that that they could go to the temple, go, go immerse, go to the temple, do a ritual, come back, and and the bread is still rising or just finishing rising. So this is quite a process it, when you're making your daily bread between the grinding, the rising, and then the cooking. And and cooking didn't take too long, and they had these uh, typically shared ovens in the courtyards, as we said. But still, uh, when Christ says, "Give us this day our daily bread," that's that's a process. You have to have grown or purchased the the grain. You have to have enough of it. You have to grind it and go through all of this. Um, and so bread was a, 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 an important staple uh, and uh, a part of many, many, many meals, uh, and it took some work. So that's just worth thinking about. Here are some of the other things that they would often eat. Um, so all sorts of grains, like we said, grapes, olives, dates, figs, uh, what we call citrons. It's not actually mentioned in the Old Testament, but a lot of people think that's what it is. It's, it's maybe, you know, it's a citrus fruit that... Other citrus fruits seem to be descended from, but anyway, citrons, uh, pomegranates, walnuts, almonds, onions, cucumbers, legumes, uh, hyssop, scallions, garlic, fish, um, milk and milk products, right? Butter and uh, uh, the yogurt kind of things and so on. More goat milk than cow milk, but some of both. Most people could afford a goat and couldn't afford a cow. Um, they would eat some meat, but not as much as as we would think. Chicken is is uh, just being introduced by the Romans, so chicken is not really common. Geese were more common, uh, but uh, of course they 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 were they raised a lot of sheep and goats uh, because you could use the hair for their clothing, uh, as we've talked about. And in the last one, I think, and you know, you could use linen from from flax, uh, and you can use wool, but you can't mix the two. In any case, so a lot of people would have goat. Uh, or sheep, and um, you don't eat them that often because you need them for their meat and their their hair or their wool. Um, but on occasion, of course, you would kill. And the same thing with a cow, but on occasion, you would kill and, and eat that meat. Uh, and often that took place when you had a sacrifice. Uh, you'd do the sacrifice, and then you'd eat it. And that's probably the most common way or time you would have uh, that meat for the, the common person. Other people could, who were more wealthy could have it more often. Honey was great. Um, bay, cumin, fitch, coriander, uh, anise, uh, mint, saffron, sumac, sage, salt. All of those are, are some of the, the common things that they would eat. Um, and of course, you have to work on storing these things so that they don't get bad. So, for example, we know in, in granaries, they would often dump some wine in there. And uh, the fermenting of the wine as the gases came up, that would kind of kill the bugs to keep it from getting infested with bugs and that kind of thing. Uh, so you have to find good ways to store these, especially where uh, all of that area can get really hot in the summer. Um, storing is another thing uh, to talk about when we talk about water. Water is the most important thing to have. Uh, and if you live, uh, you know, by the Jordan River, or as it's coming in or out of the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Galilee, then you can get some water uh, in uh, from those places. I uh, might want to sift through it to get it, uh, you know, without too much junk in it, but uh, but you can get water. But for mo many people, um, they had to store it in cisterns. Uh, a cistern is where you carve into the the rock a hole. 
uh, and you probably try and uh, filter or, or funnel things so that like it would come off of your house and off the roads around your house and the courtyards and stuff into this hole. And you'd plaster that hole with uh, you'd melt limestone and so on. You can make a plaster and, uh, and that would help hold the water. And then uh, you have this rainy season that's like three to four months. And then the rest of the year, there's no rain. And so by the end of the rainy season, you're drinking water that's eight months old in there. And it, it can get to be not not so good, right? Which is part of why you prefer living water to non-living water, which can get yicky. Uh, so living water where it's flowing is, is much better. But for many people... Uh, their water for part of the year would, would be from these cisterns for a good part of the year would be from these cisterns as you get this uh, uh, kind of older water that's stored in there. So I hope that helps you uh, picture life a little bit. Combine this with the one I did with Trevin Hatch a little while ago where we talk about, you know, how for farmers and fishers and so on, uh, especially farmers, you, you'd have to lend or borrow money at the beginning of the season. And if you had a bad season, then you can't pay your debts. And that's part of why the savior is going to talk about, you know, people who are in the, the, the poor house or debtor's prison and uh, about debts and that kind of a thing and planting and so on. So I hope you can combine all of this to just come to picture a little bit more what uh, life was like uh, in the time of the Savior as he is uh, going around preaching in the Galilee area and also in, in uh, Jerusalem and the Judea area. 